what's up everybody um first of all i've got to say a huge thank you to everybody who sent messages of congratulations and support after yesterday's uh, announcement from yesterday's video um, as you will have seen from the video i am absolutely thrilled about it i'm really excited by the whole prospect and uh, i sat last night reading through i mean literally i read every single one of your messages so thank you i really appreciate them all it's very kind of you all um today though fully focused back on formula one as we are going to look ahead to this weekend's Bahrain GP. And as will be the case at every one of my race preview videos this year, it's going to come at you in association uh, with the GPbox.com, who have been kind enough to offer up through their suppliers uh, some incredible prizes um, over the course of the season. We had one, of course, uh, which is a brilliant painting of Lewis Hamilton, which we gave away last time out for the Australian Grand Prix. Today we have another. You'll find out what that prize is and how to win it at the end of this video. Stay tuned. If you don't know about the gpbox.com, they are well worth checking out. And I will, of course, put a link in the description of the video. But they're an online marketplace, a little bit like, I guess, uh, eBay. Uh, but specifically for motorsport products and memorabilia and artwork and merchandise and anything motorsport related, uh, including Formula One and other types of motorsport as well, can be found on there. It's such a brilliant idea. I didn't know about it until recently. Uh, and it's kind of why we're doing this partnership together, because I feel like lots of people don't know about it, and, and yet they should. Right then, round two of the 2019 Formula One World Championship comes from Sakia. Uh, in Bahrain and uh, this is a track that I really like. It's a race that transitions between daylight into the floodlights of the evening and that again makes it unique. That unique characteristic of course also throws up a number of different challenges that other racetracks just don't and that I like. I love the fact that we have different types of circuits at different races. Uh, this could not be more different uh, to the Australian Grand Prix, where we were just a couple of weeks ago. And that means that the, the pecking order, the order of the teams, I fully expect uh, to be kind of shaken up a little bit, to be, to be mixed up and to get some kind of different perspective on the order um, of the performance of each of the teams in the championship, which is exactly what we want. I think, I think Australia gave us a sort of slightly false impression of who was uh, quick and who wasn't. I certainly don't think uh, Ferrari are as off the pace as they were in Australia and I think Bahrain is going to be the perfect place for them and others to really show what they've got. We'll take a closer look at the circuit in a moment um, but the challenges that it throws up um, for the teams are very different ones to that of Australia and they come in a number of forms. I mean obviously uh, we're in the middle of the desert uh, and that tends to mean that temperatures uh, kind of go through the roof um, but uniquely for this race the temperatures vary enormously over different parts of the weekend. We have a situation in Bahrain where uh, free practice one and free practice three again on Saturday are done in the daytime where it's incredibly hot, uh, the sun is at its, its strongest I guess, uh, the track temperature can get well over 50 degrees, um, really high ambient temperatures as well but then FP2 qualifying and the race are done at 6 p.m. in the evening where temperatures are much cooler, the light's starting to disappear, um, the track massively falls in terms of its temperature and that has massive impact on things like the tyres, of course. Uh, the tyres really don't like the heat, uh, certainly not those extreme levels of heat that you get out in places like Bahrain and so thermal degradation in the hotter sessions can be massive compared to what we might see in the race. Um, also, of course, things like uh, power unit cooling, electronics cooling, gearboxes, those kind of things uh, can massively overheat or can very easily overheat in the hotter sessions. And so the teams have to be very careful about how they, how they manage their running during those sessions and how they manage the cooling on the car. Because you need to open up the bodywork to manage the, the hotter temperatures, of course, to allow more air to flow through uh, the sort of radiator ducts and the cooling outlets of the car. You don't want to open up and open them up too much because it costs you aerodynamic performance. It starts to impact the uh, the efficiency of the car aerodynamically. Um, but you need to find the right balance, and that's quite hard to do when your the temperatures you're running in are fluctuating so enormously. Um, there is the option to to put panels onto the car 
particularly in those louvers around the headrest, and I know lots of teams do this, where you put a, a panel around that louver that's easily removable at a pit stop because the temperatures that you find on Saturday may be different to the ones you'll find on Sunday, but Park Ferme rules mean that you can't change the car between Saturday qualifying and Sunday's race. The first opportunity you really get to change anything will be at a pit stop um, during the Grand Prix. So that has to be a quick removable panel if you want to open up cooling more uh, on a Sunday afternoon. The fact that those sessions uh, occur in such wildly different conditions sometimes does mean that FP2, the Friday afternoon or early evening session, really is the important one in terms of practice. That's the one which is most representative of the, the crucial qualifying and race conditions that we're going to get later in the weekend. And that means that, uh, you know, all of the, the sort of long run data is collected during that session. Uh, teams trying to work on their race pace. They will also be doing qualifying runs. They have to cram an awful lot into that 90 minute session. But it, it does mean that FP1 and FP3, they're not useless. They can be used for other things, but the engineers have to be very careful about how they uh, you know, interpret the data that comes from it, whether it's things like temperatures, whether it's tyre wear, uh, or tyre degradation rather. Um, those things have to be, you know, the temperatures have to be factored in and what temperatures they're going to be running on later in the weekend. So it's very easy to get lost as an engineer in those kind of conditions and that's why most focus is put onto FP2 uh, in Bahrain. One of those circuits that you might hear the commentators saying or engineers saying it's rear limited um, and what that means is that uh, they're talking about tyres, it's rear tyre wear limited uh, or rear tyre deg limited. Um, and that's because this is a, a circuit that has massive longitudinal forces on the car. It's lots of uh, point and shoot straights into heavy braking zones. Um, so that means that traction out of those tight slower corners uh, and braking into those corners is really, really important. But the traction is a thing. Uh, it's a quite abrasive circuit. In fact, it's a very abrasive circuit. Um, so that means if you start putting the power down at the slow corners where there's massive acceleration out of a slow corner onto a straight. Um, if you start spinning up the rear tyres, which is very easy to do, on this type of circuit really will destroy the rear tyres quickly. So when we talk about rear limited, it means that our performance um, on the car is limited by how much we can look after the rear tyres. It means the rear tyres will be the first thing that degrades and wears away and starts to lose the car performance over the course of a race if you're not careful. Uh, the fact that this circuit is so abrasive actually I think is, is something to do with the fact that when it was built uh, it was built with granite so the circuit itself was constructed from granite I believe imported from England of all places out to Bahrain and, um, and part of the makeup the aggregate of that circuit makes it very very kind of rough and abrasive uh, and pretty brutal on the tyres so so that is the thing, tyres have to be well looked after, well managed, and as a result Pirelli have brought uh, the hardest three compounds in their range, uh, both to deal with that abrasiveness and the temperatures that we're likely to see. Uh, aero levels are generally just below medium, pretty low to medium I would say, in terms of downforce levels on the cars. Uh, that's because we've got, we've essentially got four straights on this circuit, uh, reasonably evenly spaced around the lap, uh, with some tight twisty bits in between. The sand definitely has an impact here, you know, we are in the middle of a desert, so the circuit is, is very kind of dusty and dirty in between sessions, at the start of sessions. Nobody really wants to go out first, uh, particularly in FP1, you'll likely see lots of cars just sitting in the garages because no one wants to go out and be the track cleaner, uh, particularly in a, in a session that's maybe not that representative for the rest of the weekend. So. Quite often we get very little action in FP1, certainly at the start of the session for that very reason. As the end of the session approaches, teams will start to go out and do what they can. Uh, but it's a, it's a frustrating session for commentators, um, particularly FP1, as I say. Uh, but the sand, you know, not only makes the circuit dusty, it not only makes it low grip, um, but it does start to do, and not massively, but it starts to clog up air filters over the course of a race weekend, uh, or certainly over the course of a race. Uh, not hugely, it's not a massive problem. Uh, it actually does uh, really kind of abraze the front of the car. So when you get a car back at the end of a race, you can see it's almost like it's been sandblasted. Well, it has been sandblasted. 
uh, and the paint's all taken off and it starts to be dimpled. And actually, when you really drill down into the details, as Formula One teams always do, that does have an aero impact, negative aero impact, um, because the surface of the, of the, the car's aero surfaces are no longer smooth uh, as they were intended, but almost kind of pop-marked. Um, so not, not a massive deal, but that's just one of the finer details that Formula One teams love to consider, and it does have an impact. The pit lane is long here, one of the longest, I think, uh, of the year. I think from memory it takes, I think it's something like 25 seconds to make a pit stop. That's your pit lane loss time. So from entering the pit lane, making your pit stop itself and getting back out, back out again can be up to 25 seconds, uh, which is a lot. And that means that teams will always favour uh, a minimum number of pit stops, i.e. if they can, a one stopper. I know we've become used to that. But that's uh, this particular circuit perhaps even more important. Uh, as the temperature drops during the race, uh, you tend to find that the tyres will start to last longer than they were perhaps in the practice sessions when it was hotter. And, and that can then start to, to favour a, a kind of longer stint. Um, so you might find that the, the first, the opening stints of the race, just get pushed and pushed and pushed, waiting for somebody to pull the trigger and start that chain reaction of, of pit stops. Um, but because temperatures, and actually I think this weekend temperatures are forecast to be maybe a little cooler than they perhaps have been. And in fact, there's even rain in the air, believe it or not, in the desert. Right, let's take a look at this circuit then. It may not be a circuit that's full of history. It may not even have a huge amount of soul about it. But it is a track that's provided a great deal of spectacular racing in the past. Right, onto the first of three DRS zones, the longest straight on the circuit, start finish straight, pit lane on your right hand side, maximum speed along here, before a very heavy braking zone into turn one. This is a big overtaking opportunity because it's nice and wide and the car's got to slow down from maximum speed for one of the slowest corners. Then we're tight through turns two and the right hander of three before we get onto this little blast along this straight which will be a brand new DRS zone for this year. Now turn four, again nice and wide on entry, was always an opportunity to overtake. This year with the aid of DRS, even more so, will Daniel Ricciardo lick the stamp and send it uh, through there as he likes to do so much. This particular sector here, fast, clipping the low curbs on the left and on the right, pulling the car back over around the left hander. This is all very sort of high speed chicane type stuff through this sector. Uh, out wide again before turning in, a little blast on the throttle down towards this section of turns uh, 9 and 10. Now this is tricky, a double left-hander, really easy to lock the brakes. You're turning and braking at the same time, getting the car slowed right down, clipping the apex before we then get onto what will be the next DRS straight. Now you can see already, can't you, from just looking at the first parts of this circuit, how much it's hard on brakes, real stop-start and then out of very slow corners having to get throttle hard on early and the power down, uh, putting the stress through the rear tyres, uh, which is why I said it's a longitudinal circuit. Lots of slow corners onto fast straights, which means lots of torque being transmitted through those Pirelli rear tyres. Looking after them will be absolutely key. A little bit up and down then, rising up into the last sector, out of this right-hander where you've just got to hang on and hang on, the circuit, the abrasive nature of the circuit taking its toll on the outside tyres before we get back onto this final straight. No DRS here, but important to get right out wide and get a nice turn in, nice entry and an important exit because then we get back onto another start-finish straight, another, another lap, maximum speeds down there. I touched on it earlier on, one of the longest pit lanes on the Formula 1 calendar means that people are not going to want to get in there if they can possibly help it. Right, this week's giveaway from the gpbox.com comes from one of their suppliers, The Mechanists, and it is in this box. You can follow The Mechanists on Instagram, at The Mechanists. They are an automotive lifestyle brand, and this week they have supplied, for this giveaway, a beautiful sterling silver handmade revival steering wheel bracelet. Uh, fully adjustable, so it'll fit anybody on a red magma cord band. Uh, that is worth 65 quid uh, not to be sniffed at. And I think it's rather lovely. 
Look at that, I really like it. They have a full range on the site. And to win this, it's very simple. You've got to work a little bit this week, but not very much. I need you to go to the gpbox.com, type in the mechanists in the search field, you'll end up on the mechanists page uh, within gpbox.com. I want to have a look through their stuff and then send me a link. So simply copy and paste a link to your favorite item from the mechanists into the comment section of this video. Include with it the hashtag GPBBAH, so that's GP Box uh, Bahrain, hashtag GPBBAH. And on Monday, at the end of the Q&A video, I will scroll through all of the hashtags, looking at all of your favorite items from the Mechanist's page, and pick a lucky winner who will receive this. I think it's a great item, so different, but so nice. Old school, classic, revival steering wheel in sterling silver bracelet. Love it. Right, thank you very much to the mechanics, thank you to gpbox.com and thank you to you lot. Enjoy the Bahrain Grand Prix. See you soon.